Archimedes Stage Campus Party Europe, second day afternoon. Now we we have a talk about uh, another super nice topic, but a very is it is it common? Yes, actually. <laughs> okay, so please welcome Mrs. Perry. She talks about cyber stalking. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. Normally I'm talking to police officers, social workers, probation officers, and they're not very tech savvy. So I spend my time explaining technology and how it works and, and how abusers and criminals use it against their victims. So it's nice to be here to talk to technology people, the next generation, who probably know a lot more about technology than actually than I do. But what you probably don't understand as much about is how criminals think, how they work, and how they abuse technology against their victims. And that's what I really want to talk to you about today. I'm going to use stalking as an example, but all areas of criminology could benefit from developers thinking more like criminals and how they can abuse the technology. So what is stalking? Well, we talk about cyber stalking. Cyber stalking is, is only when it's happening online and not in the offline world. But all victims of stalking now have a digital element. So cyber stalking is common amongst bloggers, twitters, and things like that. And companies need to be aware that if they've got their employees going out into the cyber world, they need to really think about what happens if they're blogging on their behalf and they become a victim on their behalf. We're seeing cyber stalking and stalking increasing in the UK. It's about one in five women will be cyber stalked at some time during their life, and one in ten men. And we're seeing that escalating. And those statistics are very similar in the United States and actually here on the continent. Cyber stalking goes beyond antisocial behavior. It goes into assaults, rapes, and homicides. About 70% of domestic violence women are also stalked. And the combination of domestic violence and stalking is a very high risk for homicide. We have about two women a week murdered by their partners. And that equates to over one point some odd women also being stalked and murdered. That doesn't count assaults and doesn't count rapes as well. Most victims will be stalked at least a hundred times. There will be something happening a hundred times before they report it to the police. And the reason is you don't immediately say, oh my God, somebody's stalking me. It starts off lower than that. It starts off, somebody's paying me attention. They're a bit of a nuisance. God, they're getting really awkward. Oh, they're creeping me out. Now I'm scared. And that's when they go to the police, or that's when they go to seek help. It's at the point where they realize this isn't just somebody checking them out. is isn't somebody just being nosy about who they are. It's somebody who's become obsessed. Like a gambler becomes obsessed with gambling. A stalker becomes obsessed with their victim. And they will spend hours each day monitoring them, intimidating them, humiliating them. They spend their whole lives focused on this individual. And this individual has no choice. This stalker is trying to force a relationship onto this victim. That's why they'll call it mental rape sometimes, because you don't want that relationship, but your stalker is forcing you to engage with them through their behavior. There are five types of stalkers. There's the intimacy seeker. This is the person that has a crush on a movie star or somebody else. They don't necessarily want a sexual relationship, they just want a relationship. It could be a woman saying, oh, if Jennifer Anderson met me, we'd be the best friends, right? It's that type of fantasy of getting to know someone. And they think that that person knows them. That somehow through the media or through words or through actions, they're talking directly to them and encouraging them. The next is the incompetent suitor. I have to say it's mostly men. And those are men that are not um, comfortable with women, don't know how to approach women. And their approach is basically to stalk them. 
And normally once you talk to them and explain how their actions are actually frightening, you can get those incompetent suitors to stop the stalking. So not particularly a high risk stalker. We have the rejected stalker. 60% of all stalking victims are an ex-partner. Okay, so you get rejected, but one person in that relationship is not ready for that relationship to be over. And stalking is a substitute for that relationship. Okay, but sometimes they start to get angry. They don't get what they want, and they become a resentful or revenge stalker. And they'll go from one to the another. I love you, I love you, I love you, I want you back, to I hate you, you bitch, you're going to pay. And then they'll go back to I love you, I love you, I love you. And they'll go from back and forth. But the resentful stalker is also one that we have men falling into. The, the, the male victims often are stalked by people by their work colleagues or people they know, not necessarily just ex-partners. So work colleagues get jealous, felt like he got a promotion or that he didn't deserve, and they become revengeful. And male victims tend to suffer much more from reputation damage, financial damage. They're trying to get them fired. They're trying to make them lose money. They're trying to ruin their business. That's where we see male victims stalking affects them the most. Interesting enough, 20% of all stalking takes place in the workplace. So 60% is ex-partners. 20% is in your workplace environment. Only about 9% is this complete stranger stalking that you hear about. The last category is the predator stalker. This is your pedophiles, your serial rapist, and your sadistic stalker. Okay, and they have different typography. A rejected stalker who's a domestic violence stalker is a narcissist by trait, and they have little empathy. But a sadistic stalker has a lot of empathy. He knows exactly what he's doing, he understands the pain, and that's what they're getting off on. Different traits of a stalker, all stalkers are delusional. Okay, you can harass someone, you can bully someone, and be a fairly normal person. Okay, but if you're stalking someone, you kind of lost the plot. You become delusional, and there's different types of delusion. So there's jealousy delusion, erotomania, um, persecutory delusions. So the problem with stalkers is you have a problem with them understanding the difference between fantasy and reality. So how do you start to deal with someone, get them to stop when you can't talk to them rationally? If you're talking to a narcissist, right, you can't go to them and say, you're hurting this person, he doesn't care. Have you ever read somewhere where a man or a woman goes in and kills the children? to get revenge on the partner, or kills the partner and the children. That's because he's a narcissist. He has absolutely no empathy for what he's doing to his own children or what he's doing to that woman. So the only way you can work with a narcissist is try to convince them that the woman is no good and he deserves better. It sounds abhorrent, but if the goal is to stop the harassment, you as a psychologist or you're working with them, We'll do anything to try to relieve that, that pressure. So what does a victim feel? Well, as you'd expect, a lot of them receive unsolicited phone calls, emails, texts, tweets, whatever form of communication in abundance. Claire Waxman was a, a victim in the UK. Her stalker Googled her 40,000 times in a year. Okay? It's over a hundred times a day. And stalkers, they kind of lose a sense of what's normal. And if you talk to a stalker and say, well, do you text her? Yeah, some. What, five times a day? No. Ten times a day? No. Probably about 40 times a day. And they think that's normal. Forty times a day, yeah. And they, they lose all sense of perspective. And actually, the victim starts to lose all sense of perspective, too, because they're so overwhelmed with this behavior, the only way they can cope with it is to start to normalize it. 
67% have been spied on, either in person or, or used um, remote software. One of the biggest problems I see is remote uh, spyware onto computers. And if I have a stalking victim, the first thing I do is make them put on anti-spyware and get any spyware off their computer. Stalkers threaten suicide, they're highly manipulative, they will threaten anything in order to get this person to do what it is that they want to do. 19% of homes are broken into, not stolen. A common thing for a stalker to do is to break into a home and just move things about. All he's doing is sending a message to the victim. I can do this. I can move things about. And what does the victim do? Call the police. I think he's broken in. I can't prove it. Why do you think that? My candle was moved. What do you think the police are going to do? Right? Or the victim starts to think they're losing their mind. And this is part of what the stalker wants to do. They want to unsettle the victim so much and disorient their own reality. Right. 18% have been sexually assaulted. So when people talk about harassment and stalking online, the police generally think of it as an antisocial behavior, kind of like trolls, you know. But it does lead to 18% of them being raped or physically assaulted. 15% of people have their pets abused big problem amongst domestic violence women to get them into hostels because if they've got a pet they can't take their pet into hostels so they stay with the abusers to protect the pets 12 percent of their children have been threatened this goes back to the narcissist they will do anything use anyone to get what they want okay so that's just some of the experiences they'll send flowers, they'll, they'll take um, trophies, they'll steal mobile phones, they will do criminal damage. There's all sorts of things a stalker will do. So some specific examples. People talk about cyber stalking, say, oh, cyber stalking. That's not as bad as real life stalking. Take this example of a woman who lived in London, doesn't know who her stalker is. Could be a work colleague, could be a friend, could be a member of family, because that's another big section. No idea her stalker is, whether it's a man or a woman. But the stalker tells her in detail that he's going to kill her, or she's going to kill her. And she tells him how she goes to work every day, which tube stop she gets on and off, and says, one day, I'm going to push you in front of the train. What does she do? Every day she goes down to that tube, every day she's looking around thinking, is my stalker beside me or behind me? So they end up leaving her job and 40% of stalking victims lose their job either because they can't cope with the stress, because the work people can't cope with the problems that they're going through, or as this woman, they feel so unsafe they can no longer go to work. This was a male victim we had. So remember what I was saying about how male victims suffer from reputation? Well, this guy went online, found out where his kids went to school, found an online parental directory, and started contacting them. And started spreading rumors about this guy until his kids come home and said, Daddy, are you going to prison? That's the type of reputation damage they'll do. When I heard of this, I didn't, I, you know, well, one of my themes today is thinking about criminals, and I hadn't thought of this, but we had a victim whose partner knew her username and password for eBay, right? So he waits for her to buy something, then he waits a few more days, contacts the supplier and said, you know, that didn't arrive. Where did you send it? The supplier says, oh, I, I sent it to so-and-so. And the guy went around, beat her till she was hospitalized, and she was left permanently blinded in her left eye. And stalkers will contact suppliers, they will contact friends, they'll contact work colleagues, they'll pretend to be journalists, they'll pretend to be anything in order to extract information. A victim came home to her partner one day, and he played out 
a phone conversation she had, right? She had no idea how he did this. It was in a local cafe, right? So did he bug the cafe? And it wasn't until I was talking to a social worker and we're discussing the thing. What he'd done is he had put something on her mobile phone and was listening through the mobile phone and recorded it. And then the social worker went, why does she? And she said, God, she was just in my office discussing her escape plan. What if he was listening to her planning her escape, which is a really high risk time for domestic violence victims, right? One of the most common things that we see is men going online, pretending to be their ex-partners, and soliciting sex from other men and sending them to their ex-partner's house. And they go one step further. They will go in there and say, I have a rape fantasy. I want you to break in and rape me. And we had the, this happened recently in the United States. Guy read this, believed it went to the States. Unfortunately, he didn't know she had a gun. Okay. She didn't kill him or even hit him, but, you know, it caused a problem for the guy there. And of course, the guys, if they fulfill this rape fantasy, will be charged with rape. But it's a very common thing that we see amongst stalkers. And, on, and women on men. Women will do the same thing. They'll go online and, and do order things online on behalf of their partners and things. So what's the impact on the victim? It is so hard for me to stand up here and give you any semblance of what it's like to be stalked. Think about if your parents were divorced or you had a breakup or you had an excruciating deadline or you thought you were going to fail a subject or you got fired or whatever the, one of the most stressful scenarios in your life is, and then try to imagine that scenario going on for months or years at a time, what would it do to you? You would feel physically sick. You would be stressed. You couldn't focus. You couldn't be able to function like you used to. And this is what happens to stalking victims. They go into a fright or flight scenario with their bodies, and they can't get out of that because they never know when the stalker's going to strike. What's he going to do next? So they stay in a heightened anxiety mode for exceeding long, long periods of time. Even when their stalker's locked up because some stalkers have access to internet access in prison. And it's an enormous amount of stress that ruins every aspect of their life. It ruins them Physically, mentally, financially, they lose their jobs. They have to spend money legally. They have to spend money buying locks for their um, premises. They may have to leave and move house. Um, they end up becoming isolated. If you don't know who your stalker is, you suspect everyone. Absolutely everyone. Can you imagine suspecting everyone in your life, not be able to confide in anyone? It's incredibly isolating. I've never met a stalking victim who hasn't contemplated suicide. There is no end to the stalking and they can't think of any way to get away from the stalker other than to kill themselves. They all think about it. And we don't have any statistics about how many are directly related. But if you think about young people and how many stories you hear about them committing suicide through harassment or bullying, right? That wasn't harassment or bullying. I guarantee you that was a form of stalking. They just call it bullying because it's a young person. So we know it leads directly to suicides. So what do I do? I look specifically at technology because the victims don't get any reprieve from the police often. The police don't know how to look up and identify who's doing it. They have little powers. We've just got through some new legislation in the UK and the EU is looking at new legislation. But currently, they might get six months in jail. If it's a death threat, they might get a year. Okay? Does it seem a long time when you've got a victim that's been stalked for five years, really? 
So I'm trying to help victims understand and protect themselves from the technology. And I, I look at a lot of range of technology, but I'm not looking at stalkers. God, I mean, if I, my stalkers are all the developers, I'd just be in a world of hurt. I'm looking at stuff that's off the shelf, easy to find. If you Google spy on my wife, spy on my girlfriend, you will see the type of off-the-shelf things that you can buy, right? It's easy to use, it's consumerized for you, and it's inexpensive. So there's a lot of technology available for anyone to find really quickly and easily. So you've got computer spyware, it's fantastic. You can put it on somebody's computer, you just send them an email, convince them to open it, and then you have access to the whole computer. Mobile spyware, you have to have access to the mobile, but a lot of ex-partners do. Spoof SMS, one thing stalkers love to do is pretend to be the victim. So they send themselves SMSs and say, look, I'm not harassing her. Look at this text. She's harassing me. Uh, you can buy uh, mobile apps that are free. The Find My Phone app that you can see on phones is great because they all turn on the microphone. You don't even have to pay for it. You can put, find my phone app and have it have it tied to your account instead of your victim's account. If your next partner, it's easy to do. So you can track her where, wherever she is. Uh, you can buy mobile phones. The spy were already loaded on it for you. And we see this with people that have access to children. So they buy the teens or tweens, the latest new phone with spyware on it, and send it home to their partner so they can track what's happening in the house, where they're living. GPS car trackers, we see them all the time. They only cost, what, about $180, $115 pounds. Wi-Fi cameras, we talk about breaking in and just moving things around. Or they can replace a smoke alarm with a Wi-Fi camera or an air freshener. A lock picking set, I mean, you can buy that. I don't know if that makes you a lock picker or not. Listen through the wall devices so they can just stand outside and listen to conversations in the house. Amazing range of technology. And if you just type in spy equipment, you'll see a whole list of people selling it. But the, most, the, the, the one of the most dangerous ones is account takeover. Okay? I don't know, there's not really an answer used to authentication. I mean, people have talked about the issue about username and passwords not being the best authentication system. But it is the biggest threat for victims, like the eBay example. But you think about it, you don't need to do mobile phone spyware because if you can access the iCloud or the Google account, you can track that phone anyway. If they're backing up their phone and their texts and their photos into the cloud, you can see all their photos and things. So the biggest problem I have with victims is getting them to change all their passwords or managing passwords. So I'd usually put them onto a password manager because that's, you know, after you get that initiated, it works very well. But it is very difficult because we're all lazy and we all use obvious passwords. So that's the first thing I do is get victims to change password. And I have to tell victims, what do you do if you're grabbing your keys and leaving your ex-partner, right? You turn off your mobile phone. If it's an Android, you have to take out the battery because it's still transmitting, okay? You change your passwords. And then when you get saved, I have another long list of all the other things they need to do. And besides that long list, the police will give you 50 things you need to do. So we're putting the onus on the victim of what they need to do to protect themselves. So this is a real American advert for mobile spyware. Okay? It is so bad it's good again type of advert. A business associate of mine had used M-Spy to learn that his wife was having an affair. By using M-Spy, he was able to catch her red-handed, which saved him thousands of dollars in legal fees and court costs. As a business owner, I work a lot of late nights. Can you hear that? They can't hear it. Weeks. I started to fear that it was costing me.
a business associate of mine who used M-Spy to learn that his wife was having an affair. By using M-Spy, he was able to catch her red-handed, which saved him thousands of dollars in legal fees and court costs. As a business owner, I work a lot of late nights. Weeks. I started to fear that it was costing me. Can you hear it? In front of her, she denied it. She even said that I could hire a private detective. Once again, I turned to m to monitor her calls, Can you hear that at all? A few months. That's not Okay, well, we'll just skip that. What he says is, I used to spy. I was afraid my wife was having an affair, and she said I could hire a detective, but that costs money. So I used M-Spy. It only cost $18 a month. And I checked her, and she wasn't having an affair. But that was the end of the story. One day, she was going down the road, and um, she had a wreck. And I was able to find out where she was. And with the M-Spy, I was able to give the coordinates to the police. And they said, if I hadn't gone there, my wife could have died. Thank you, M-Spy. Okay. And then it goes on and tells you all the things that you can do to spy on your loved ones or just somebody if you're curious. And I'll go through this list here in a minute, which you'll be able to read. So very much like um, you, uh, PC spyware, right? You have access to their data, to their contacts. You can wipe phones so they can't contact the people they need to contact. You can read their texts. So this is the type of spyware that I'm very concerned about because it gives location and information that can what we call a trigger. The one that I'm kind of the least familiar with and behind on technology and struggling to keep up with is some of these mobile apps aggregators that are now starting to come out. And this concerns me. There's a, an app called um, Girls Around. Do you all know about this app? It was pulled. And what it was, it, it told you basically what females were around and you could pull up the social networks and see if they were pretty or not pretty. It worked for men, but the guy who did it was, he said, I only developed it so you could avoid ugly women. Right? Okay. I mean, I would love to see a picture of him and see if he's one of those ugly men I would have avoided, you know. But it was a really naive thing for him to do. And it got pulled because it caused outrage because of the fantastic stalking device. Because you could look somebody up, get enough information, pretend that you know them because they had their college or whatever, and you know, basically go in and, and stalk them. Now I can almost forgive a mobile app developer who did that because they just weren't thinking. But then Facebook brought out something called Highlight and they pulled it very quickly. Facebook doesn't have an excuse. Facebook is big, ugly, and hires enough people to not to do something that stupid, really. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about social networks. I'm very pro social networks. I'm very pro technology generally. But social networks for stalking victims or any victims is a really useful thing. Victims get isolated, they find it difficult to continue relationships, they're often berated and low self-esteem and participating in online forums and things can really be a benefit. The problem is with social networks, I can't protect them ever on a social network, right? And. Um, and it's a really useful tool for the stalkers because it gives you a list of your friends and on average a stalker stalks 32 people around the victim. So there's a primary target and then all the friends and family are stalked because they not only want to know where they're at, stalkers want to know are they happy, are they sad, are they successful, are they having troubles? They want to know every aspect of that person's life. 
Um, it creates a trigger. We've had three deaths in the last two years as a direct result of a female changing her online status in Facebook. Changes online status from married to single, guy kills her. Okay? But the most dangerous thing about this 24-7 culture is that it feeds the obsession. Remember I talked about kind of having a gambling type of typography. A gambler starts off and at first they think oh, it's a bit of fun and then becomes an obsession. Some soccer start off and it's, you know, they're already there. Some it actually turns into an obsession. And the thing is, just like a gambler, you get that win, you get elated and you keep winning or you keep trying to win. And that's what happens with a stalker. He gets a little bit of information. He's able to con somebody else. It makes him feel good. And so they continue on that path on this obsession with stalking the victim. So it's actually social networks and things, as much as being dangerous, the thing that I find worrying is that it feeds the obsession of the stalker. Now there's nothing you can really do about feeding an obsession of a stalker. And I don't believe in a nanny state, far from it. But what I do think we need to start thinking about is um, how criminals and abusers use our technology before we, we launch the technology. So we've all seen this graph of innovators and things. But if you look at it from a different angle, innovators and early adopters are generally higher educated, more financially stable, and generally law-abiding citizens, right? But then as you get into the broader mass market, you start to get the other aspects of society, the antisocial, the opportunists, and the criminals. And you can look at eBay, and you can look at Facebook as a good example of both of these. Both of them started off with their user base being fairly well behaved, right? And then they both had huge problems with abuse coming on. So uh, eBay particularly could have spent time um, mitigating some of these issues, but they, they didn't. And whether it's a moral thing to protect consumers or an economic thing, the cost of running an abuse team and running things like um, fraud squads is really expensive. So what I want developers to do is most developers are the good guys. Right? You fall into the innovators and the early adopters. I need developers to start thinking like the bad guys. I need you to think, how is this technology going to be abused? Before you issue the technology, it should be part of the development cycles to do a risk assessment. We do risk assessments now for security, for viruses. We have regulations for e-commerce and standards with e-commerce. But we don't have it for consumer safety. The technology isn't the problem. It's the people that abuse the technology. And account takeovers is a good example of how you will never be able to design out all the problems. Okay? And that's not what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to mitigate against some of the problems and look at the problems that exist. Can we make it easier to cope with them? So poor implementation, lack of transparency, Facebook number one example, changing things, explaining features as benefits, and forgetting to mention the risks. And there's a conflict between um, privacy and profits, right? So Google and Facebook, they make their money by exploiting data. So they don't want to increase safety, because if they increase safety, it reduces profits. So what do you do in a scenario like that? I believe in self-regulation, but I think it's very difficult in the industry, if it's gonna affect their profits, you often find they won't self-regulate. So will we one day have to regulate for more consumer safety? But the problem is, the justice and the regulatory systems are lagging way behind. So by the time they get there, so much of the data and privacy and everything will have already caused enormous amount of damage. And the other issue is currently, Facebook will say, it's not our fault this guy murdered the woman. 
it's not our fault of the trolls. It's not our fault. It's not our fault. It's not our fault. But the question isn't, is it your fault? The question is, is there things that you could do that would help victims or vulnerable people avoid the damage? So I want companies to be more accountable for leaking privacy data and to secure more sensitive information. If you look at these mobile aggregators, do we really need every photo to have your geolocation information on it? We don't need that. It's a really, really high risk. Children are putting out their photos <laughs> to people we don't know. So it's a really high risk thing to put on as a default. I'm not saying we should give it the technology, I'm saying we shouldn't have it on as a default. Um, and I would like a one-click universal. I don't think everybody has to have the same privacy settings, right? Because the victims are a small percentage. But what I would like is a one-click, if I'm a victim, set my privacy settings because I don't know everything I should be clicking. Right? Why make them have to make the decision when the organizers or the, the product people will know better what they should have to click? So these are some of the things I think we need to look at. Time limits on data, the ability to purge data. This is uh, the right to be forgotten, which is currently going through the EU. This legislation they're looking at. These are some of the things that I would like to see, but more importantly, I'd like to see the next generation looking at risks as part of the development cycle. Thank you. So, are there any questions? Are there any are there any questions? Um. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Do you have any questions? There's one there. Where? I okay. I'd like if we could to talk a little more about maybe the roots of this kind of problems and a bit less about uh, just what we can do uh, at the end when they arrive, when we are victims of stalking, but a bit more about uh, uh, social roots of this kind of uh, problems in our society. Well, I th antisocial behavior has been around since, uh, gosh, I, I can't remember, but, but, but Roman times, okay? And we've seen it in literature for a long time. So stalking isn't something new, it's just escalating. The, really the only way to treat a stalker is to put them on antipsychotics and one-to-one -one therapy. It's very difficult. It's like treating a pedophile. Pedophiles and stalkers have a law that is, pedophiles are a type of stalking anyway. They have a law of the same typography. It's very difficult to cure a stalker. Okay, um, some are easier to cure than others, you know, and you'll find a stalker will stalk multiple victims. A friend of mine who was stalked, the only reason why he got banged up was because he attempted murder to another victim. So really the only reprieve we can give victims is to take a harder stance against stalking. If you're a stalker in the United States, you can get up to 10 years in prison. If you're a stalker in the UK, you might get six months. There's a big disparity here. Why stalking starts? I mean, we, we, it goes along with the antisocial issues. It's um, you know, why does it? Why are there antisocial happening? Why do? Why are there trolls? Why is there harassment? Why is there bullying? There's lots of different reasons people get engaged in that. Lack of power, lack of role models, lack of discipline. You know, there's all sorts of issues about that. I just try to advise victims on how to shut, shut down the different loopholes in which people can get to them. Because what I'm trying to do is stop the stalker getting more information about the victim, to isolate the victim from the stalker electronically. Um, 
do you think there needs to be a cultural change within the developer community in terms of assessing these risks? I, uh, I, I think there will be. I think that the, as generation grows up, you're already seeing a backlash amongst teenagers on privacy issues. Okay, you know, Facebook says this generation doesn't care about privacy. Well, that's not true. We're seeing a backlash now when they start to understand when young people get to the point where privacy impacts them. It doesn't impact them at 15. It impacts them when they go off to get a job. It impacts them when their parents see them. So we do see an impact on that. I'm very worried about kind of trolls. I think trolls and harassment are very ugly, right? But I think there will be a back lash against that. A new website we have just started playing with called Scruples, which is to try to filter out some of the ugliness that you see with some of these other social networks. So you know, I, th I think you know, you're right. It would be better to have a cultural shift than impose from down on top a change, and that's what I would like to see. What happens, what happens if the stalker doesn't get the information he wants to have? It doesn't get angrier or what? I mean, what is... Sometimes they do, but, if, but the obsession starts to subside. Because if they're not getting the information, they can't do it, then the obsession subsides a bit. Interesting enough, they did a study and they found that stalkers that were poor communicators, had low kind of self-view, and lacked hobbies. So <laughs> this group of sociologists got them all hobbies. So one, they, they um, took them to a sports club. Another, they took them to a youth club. And then another one, they encouraged them to go to the pub and play games machines. Well, you can guess what happened. The guy that went to the pub to play games machine became a gambler. But what they did find is that when you got stalkers hobbies, something else to distract them, the harassment and everything went down. And the problem with stalkers is usually they're socially isolated themselves, right? I mean, they're not winners, let's be honest. You know, they're not dynamic, happy-go people. So the, what you're trying to do is to almost improve the stalker's social and own life so that he doesn't feel this uh, need to control somebody else in order to make them feel powerful. So it's, it's all about kind of improving his lot will improve the victim's lot. You know. So. Other questions? Oh. Um, I've been reading a lot lately about uh, an increase an increase in harassment in gaming with women, and I was wondering if that's something you've been hearing more about, and if there's things that women can, can do to protect themselves while gaming, but still be able to play. Well, I mean, the most obvious is don't, don't appear as a woman. One of the things we say is use an a, a anonymous name or figure or whatever. So, you know, this is the problem I have with women who do online dating. You know, they, they put up these really risque pictures and then they get the wrong attention. So that's part of the problem, but part of it is you just get women who put up completely normal pictures and still get targeted. And the problem is, is that you get predators that will go wherever women are. So if they're an online game dating, if they're online Facebook, we get sexual and financial predators. Huh? Well, in gay, it doesn't matter where it is. Gay, if they attract women in gaming, they attract women. Of course, you've also may have this element of the incompetent suitor happening in there. So, if you're going to do gaming, the things that you do is have a specific email that, that you can delete if you need to delete it, and you see where it's coming from. That you know, you block people. I assume you could block people in gaming, just like you could block another ones. Block them very quickly, and they'll go on to somebody else. You know, you just, you just have to cut off the communications that they get there. If they're in that form and you're in that area, leave that area for a period of time and then come back. You, you talked before about um, a, a lot of victims reporting this to the authorities quite late. Um, with the advent of 
especially in social media websites, you now like said you can block people, you can report the abuse. Should there not now be a shift towards educating potential victims almost about how to deal with this unwanted detention rather than trying to focus on it after it's happening? Well, I, I absolutely agree with you. The problem is the social networks don't want to educate you. They don't want to teach you how to do privacy settings. They don't want to teach. They don't want to talk about something negative on their on their space because they're afraid it'll drive people off. So until you can get people to be more open and say this is what you need to do, right? Because Facebook will say, oh, we've got all these features, right? But victims don't know how to access them or use them. That's the problem. And of course, they're shifting them all the time anyway. So until you can change their culture, corporate attitude, of being more education. I don't think we need to lock down everyone, but I do think we need to make it easier for people to understand what the problem is so they can fix it themselves, which is the work I do. Sorry, I would like to make a statement. It's not probably a question, but uh, I hope that women do not follow this advice of stopping appearing as women because as a queer media artist, uh, who I am is a queer person and I want to be in my media art sphere as who I am. And I hope that women feel the same way as uh, gaming if that's one of their hobbies because disappearing from the digital sphere as women, they may protect them from stalking but uh, may create a wider issue of uh, social representants uh, yeah. in what they do in their life. I, I agree, and if you can do all these other things and it works, right, that's great. But as I say to victims who don't want to change anything, right, if you walk down the street to your job and you know you're going to get mugged every day you walk down that street, but you can go a different route, a different form or something, and you're not going to get mugged, then you've got to make a decision about your own safety. What, I can't hear? What about making a parade for your neighborhood? That's another kind of a civil yeah. engagement, and I well, think that uh, solves the root of the problem better. Well, if you can get a community to go in on the guy stalking him, great, right? But a lot of people won't do that. So, you know, the woman has to make a decision about her personal safety and what she's willing and not willing to do. I don't want to put them under electronic house arrest, but I also don't want to read about their homicide in the paper. Actually, I like the idea of the parade with the neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> it's really great. I mean, yeah. you know, this guy they, or, or this person, they would just leave this area yeah. as soon as, as he sees that. Yeah. I, w I would like to have an ethical hacker I could call on and resolve some of my stalking issues. Uh, unfortunately, it's not legal, so I can't suggest it. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for staying here. Thank you. Now, we have a little break for five minutes. And then we're going to have another guest. Karen is coming on stage and she will talk about women in tech. Five minutes.